As we wait a few minutes to give people time to log on, I just wanted to mention that today's webinar is part of our ongoing Listen and Learn educational series, where every month we focus on a different ear or hearing related topic. Our goal is to educate, inform, and answer questions that you may have during this live interactive session with members of our medical and audiology team, as well as special guest speakers. If you'd like to watch any of our previous sessions, you can download them from our website by going to www.eardoctor.org slash events. The address is also on the bottom of this slide. Just a few housekeeping items. During this session, your audio and video will be turned off just so that everyone can easily hear the speaker. We'd also like to encourage you to use the chat function to submit your questions at any point during this presentation. Our speaker will be happy to answer all of your questions at the end of her presentation. We've also enabled live captioning for this presentation. So if your Zoom account has the feature turned on and you are not seeing a live transcript on your screen, simply click on the live transcript button on your toolbar along the bottom and then select enable auto transcription and you should see the transcription appear on the bottom of your screen. I think that covers all of the housekeeping items. Let's go ahead and get started. Today, we have a very special presentation by Julie Husting on cochlear implants and the importance of setting realistic expectations. Julie is an author and former patient of Dr. Shohet. She has had her two cochlear implants since 2012, and she has written a book entitled, I Dared to Dream, My Journey with Cochlear Implants, and her Facebook group, Cochlear Implant Daily Rehab, has over 3,000 members. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Julie. Hello, everyone. I mentored a lady that was thinking about getting a cochlear implant. She did a lot of research and she went to a lot of meetings to learn more. She qualified for one and she was definitely reading lips and she struggled with what she was hearing on a daily basis. She was pretty much convinced that it was time for her to get an implant. But then she went to a meeting where there were some people with cochlear implants and there was a crap caption presentation. And she noticed that some of the people were reading the captions. She determined that they weren't doing any better than she was with her hearing aids and that she shouldn't get one. She decided they weren't a success. In order to be successful with a cochlear implant, it's crucial that you understand the process that you have to go through. Getting implants is not the same as getting new glasses or getting hearing aids. You don't just put them on and all of a sudden you hear great again. So imagine a scale that runs from one to 10 with one being completely deaf and 10 being perfect hearing. It's unlikely that a person with a cochlear implant is ever going to get to 10. As this next slide shows. The key to success requires having realistic expectations. You need to appreciate every move along the scale on your way up to the top. If you don't recognize the little gains along the way, it's gonna be a really disappointing experience. So what can you expect? Before you begin the journey, you're likely just a one or two on the scale. You think you're doing just fine with your hearing aids, but in fact, you have to read lips pretty much 100% of the time. And even then you're missing many of the words. You likely ask people to repeat themselves regularly. You use facial cues a great deal. And you probably use, use the old smile and nod on a regular basis because let's face it, sometimes it's just easier. If it's dark, you can't hear. You're exhausted at the end of the day from concentrating so much. Hearing aids make words louder, but they don't make words clear. It's like holding a microphone up but you're still using a damaged ear. With my hearing aids, I could hear words, but I couldn't understand them. With my cochlear implants, I can understand what's being said. I use my eyes to hear with my hearing aids. Now I use my ears. A cochlear implant bike passes the damaged area and it goes directly to the auditory nerve. That makes words become more clear. The brain, however, is a bit confused in the beginning. It's never heard using this kind of technology before, and it has to learn how to use it. Let's say you got a knee plant transplant. 
you wouldn't be running a marathon right out of surgery. Your brain has to figure out how to use that new knee. You go home with a walker, you do a lot of rehab exercises, you move up to using a cane, you exercise some more, you ditch that cane and you walk with a limp, you do some more rehab exercises, and finally, you can walk well again with no pain. You're likely never going to run a marathon. You have to teach your brain how to use the new ear just like you would have had to teach it with the new knee. Unfortunately, with an ear, you can't physically see and feel those changes as the brain progresses like you can with a knee. But you can hear and appreciate those differences along the way. You will hear new things on the very first day of activation. That's the day that they turn the cochlear implant on. What you hear depends on a lot of different factors like your age, how long you've had bad hearing, how long you had good hearing that gives you a, a hearing history that your brain remembers, how long you kept your auditory nerves stimulated, things like that. I can pretty much guarantee you that you will not hear the voices the way you're used to hearing them on day one. You may hear very deep Darth Vader voices, or perhaps you'll hear high-pitched noises, voices like the munchkins from The Wizard of Oz. You may even hear R2-D2 from Star Wars, where you hear beeps for speech. Or you may hear robotic speech like C-3PO. Or maybe you'll hear the wah, wah, wah of Charlie Brown's teacher. My dad, he sounded like a little girl. Now, it sounds horrifying, but it's really not. Even those sounds with lip reading, you can still communicate. So the appreciation part comes in when you realize all of those new sounds that you're going to hear. You're gonna hear lots of environment sounds like steps on the floor, paper shuffling, elevator bells dinging, car turn signals, the beep or click when the car door is unlocked, traffic outside, things like that. These are all sounds that you probably haven't heard in a long time. I remember being in the car with my parents on my activation day, and I kept hearing this sound, but it would come and it would go, it would start and it would stop again. And we finally realized it was the car's tires on the asphalt that I was hearing. Oh no, when I got to my parents' house, I got out of the car and I heard this swoosh, swoosh sound. So I looked down the block and there was their neighbor sweeping something in the street. And that's what I was hearing. Then we went to a restaurant and I kept hearing some kind of clinking sound following by a shh noise. Well, it turns out it was a server putting ice and soda in a glass in the kitchen. So in the beginning, all of the sounds are gonna sound loud because the brain is trying to figure out what those sounds are. It doesn't know if it's an important sound or not. You're likely going to have to ask people what it is that you're hearing. As part of retraining my brain, I would take walks and I would try to figure out what those sounds were that I was hearing, like birds and leaf blowers. So once your brain figures out that a sound isn't important, it won't be as loud. I remember the first time that I heard a toilet flush in a public restroom, it was really loud. Fortunately, it's not that way anymore. You might even be able to play the sign game. If you try to understand speech without reading lips, you probably aren't going to be able to. But if you look at a sign and someone reads one of the words that are on that sign, you may be able to pick out the word that was said without reading their lips. This is great rehab when you're in the car, although not while you're the driver, or while you're walking around. On my brother's activation day, he was hearing beeps for speech. So I tried the sign game with him while we were in the car. He was driving and I was sitting behind him so he couldn't see me. And he was able to do it wearing only the new processor with no hearing aid in the other ear. Now, he swore that he would be able to do that with his hearing aids too, so we tried it. He took the processor off, he put his hearing aid back in, and he couldn't do it. Now, when you're first activated, your hearing range is at the very bottom of your audiogram. This is my audiogram with my hearing aids. Now, a normal per person's hearing is towards the top in that banana-shaped black area. 
your brain is going to begin craving more and more volume in the beginning. You're going to be sent home with programs that will allow you to add that volume to keep up with your brain. Eventually, you're going to reach the volume of a normal hearing person. So this is my audiogram a year later. As you climb higher in volume, those strange voices that you heard on that first day, they're going to sound a bit more normal. So my brother, Steve, he said that I first sounded like R2-D2, which is where he heard beeps for speech when he was activated. I then turned into C-3PO, which was robotic speech. And now I'm Princess Leia, which is human speech. So one thing that happens during this process is that you will realize how loud you're speaking in relation to everyone else. If you talk too loud, as you likely did when you wore hearing aids, you're gonna hurt your ears. So you're automatically gonna start talking softer. Now you may not appreciate that change, but your friends and your relatives definitely will. Now, if you do the rehab exercises, you're going to hear the differences in words like ten, thin, win, sin, bin, kin, fin, and pin. As these words become clearer to you, you're likely going to begin speaking more clearly yourself. Many people with hearing loss have a, a deaf accent because they can't hear those words clearly. But with a cochlear implant, you can, and you will hear yourself saying those words incorrectly. Eventually, you just start speaking more clearly. You likely may not even realize it, but again, your friends and your family are gonna notice that difference. So those are the things that you can expect in the beginning. Will you still have to read lips? Yes. Will you be able to use the phone? Probably not. Will you be able to enjoy music? Most likely not. The first and the most important goal is to understand speech clearly. Once you can do that, the rest of it is icing on the cake. That's where the realistic expectations come into play. If your definition of success means that you're only successful, if you can go to a musical and understand every word, then you're likely to be highly disappointed. But if your idea of success means that you can have a conversation without having to work so hard at understanding the words, even though you may still have to read lips and that you aren't gonna come home exhausted, then you're gonna be successful. It's best just to enjoy each phrase as it comes rather than setting unrealistic goals. As time goes on by, you're going to start moving up that scale. Now, when you get to full volume and words become more clear, you're going to find that you don't have to sit in the front row anymore. You may still need to read captions or read lips at presentations, but it's not gonna take as much effort. You're no longer gonna have the anxiety of, what if I don't get the best seat? Again, take the time to appreciate this new phase. Eventually, you're going to get to the point where you don't have to read lips as much. Unfortunately, this change happens very slowly and you may not even realize that you're no longer reading lips. I have had many people say that they're still reading lips and then I test them and they understood me just fine without reading my lips. This happens when you least expect it. I didn't know I wasn't reading lips anymore until the person I was speaking to turned their head and I realized I was still understanding. During this phase, you're going to be able to have conversations at meals easier you're going to be able to have conversations in the car easier. You may even be able to have a conversation with somebody in another room. If you look down or someone turns their head while speaking, you can still follow along in the conversation. You may even be able to understand in the dark. So once you get to that stage, the next triumph is being able to hear on the phone. You can do rehab exercises for listening on the phone. Just like that sign game that I mentioned earlier, you can have someone call you and have them read words to you from a list or a book that you can read along with. If you try to just listen, you probably won't understand them. But if you can read along with what they are saying, your brain's going to make that connection and you may be able to understand the words. Eventually, you're going to be able to have regular conversations. So music and phone use, they're a bit higher up on the scale. In the beginning, all music is going to sound like screeching cats. It's going to sound horrible, really horrible. 
don't listen to any music that you aren't familiar with in the beginning. If you do listen to music that you're familiar with, don't be surprised if it sounds like someone else is singing the songs. Those munchkins that I talked about earlier, they were singing all of the songs. You may not even be able to tell if it's a woman or a man singing. You may want to listen to instrumental music in the beginning. Some people find piano music is best in the beginning. For rehab, I recommend listening to one song that you know very well every few days. You're then be, going to be able to actually hear those changes that your ear is going through. Now, the song shouldn't be a busy song. In other words, not a lot of instruments or background vocals. The song I listened to was Your Song by Elton John. Eventually, music's going to sound better and better for you, but it can take a long time before it does. It actually took me three years before music sounded exactly as I remember. Now, some environments are going to be hard for you, even when you get near the top of the scale. Fortunately, there are programs and there are accessories to help you in noisy situations or out in the wind or in places that echo, for example. Hard floors and high ceilings, not your friend. If you need assistance in those situations, you're not a failure. I highly recommend that you keep a hearing journal to chart your progress. Here's my journal. Write down the date, the new sounds that you're hearing, and things that you're still struggling with. In the beginning, you're going to hear new things every day, and changes happen very quickly as you move up in the volume range. Eventually, all of those wow moments are going to become far fewer and farther between, but they will happen. You may become frustrated, and you may feel like you're stuck in place. And that's where the journal comes in. When you feel frustrated, read your journal. You're gonna have a physical record of all of the things that you could do that you couldn't do with your hearing aids. You're also going to see things that you had a hard time with in the beginning that may be easy later. It's nice to actually be able to see your ears move from that walker to the cane to walking on its own. The journal help is, helps you to physically see that progress that you're making. You should also bring that journal to your audiologist appointments so that they can see what you can hear well and what you're still struggling with. So remember that lady in the beginning that thought that cochlear implant people were no better off than she was because they were reading the captions? There could have been so many reasons why they were reading the captions. Maybe the acoustics in the room made it hard to hear. Maybe they were newly implanted and hadn't gotten to that point where they could go without reading lips easily. Maybe they didn't need to read the captions, but they didn't realize it. Maybe the person didn't speak clearly. In any event, the volume was likely good and they can sit anywhere that they wanted. They probably also heard the words clearly and didn't struggle to understand. So it turns out that out that, that woman did get a cochlear implant. She's doing really well and she's heard things that she hasn't heard in years. She even had a conversation with some people that she could never understand before because their lips were too hard to read. And that was when she was very first implanted. The key to success is to set your expectations low so that you won't be disappointed. Don't expect to go from one to 10 overnight. Appreciate all of the little gains that you make along the way. In the grand scheme of things, a year of changes is just a blip on the rest of your life. Always remember the three Ps, practice, patience, and persistence. Don't give up. So I'm guessing at this point, you're probably about to ask me the number one question that I'm always asked. How long did it take to get you to, take you to, get, um, to understand speech without reading lips? Now, I normally wouldn't ask, answer that question, until now. The answer is 400 hours of listening to sound with only my processor on and no hearing aid in the other ear. That's when I first noticed. It was 880 hours when I realized I could do it well. Now, if you noticed, I didn't say one month or two months. That's because the brain has to be forced to use the implant. Otherwise, it's going to do whatever is easiest. In order to force the brain to use the implant, 
you have to remove the hearing aid or plug up your good ear. Now, I personally did not wear a hearing aid at all after I was activated. I wore my processor by itself for 16 hours a day and I slept for the other eight hours. So that part doesn't count. So let me give you some things to think about. Are you right-handed, left-handed, or ambidextrous, where you can use both hands equally well? Only about 1% of the population is ambidextrous. So when we were very young, we were trained how to write. Typically, people are trained using their right hand. They write the letters over and over again until they get it right. The brain figures out that, oh, it's easier to use my right hand, so I will continue using it. It automatically grabs a glass of water with the right hand or grabs a door handle with the right hand, for example. So you don't even think about it. Does that mean that you can't write with your left hand? No. Does that mean that your bad hand, in this case, your left hand can't do other things? No. Now, if you've learned how to use a computer keyboard properly, then you type equally well with both hands. If you're a musician and you play the piano or the flute, for example, you play your instrument using both hands equally well. But if you're right-handed, you likely use your right hand to brush your teeth, brush your hair, feed yourself, and do most other tasks throughout the day. So what would you do if you broke those fingers in your right hand and you had to have a cast over your whole hands? Would you starve to death? Would you have someone else feed you the whole time that you were in your cast? Of course not. You would train your left hand to do the job that your right hand used to do. And because your right hand was in a cast, you would be forcing your brain to do it. Would it be awkward at first? Of course. Would it be difficult? Of course. Would it be frustrating? Of course. Would you likely poke your face with a fork a few times and spill food in your lap before finally get, get, getting good at feeding yourself? Of course. But eventually your brain would figure it out and it would adapt and it would use your bad left hand just as well as it did your good right hand. Now let's pretend that you and your friend Jay wanted to learn Japanese. You both sign up for the same one hour online class. You stay in America, you take the class at the same time each day, and you don't do anything else in Japanese for the other 23 hours of the day. Now, Jay decides he wants to learn it really, really quickly. So he moves to a remote village in Japan where he lives with a Japanese family. The whole village speaks only Japanese, and so does the family that he lives with. The signs are also in Japanese. When he goes to a restaurant or to the store, all he hears is Japanese being spoken around him. He takes the same one hour course that you do, but he's hearing the words that he's learned in his lessons throughout the day. He's also hearing many other words that don't make any sense to him, but he's listening and he's picking up the dialect and the rhythm of the words, and he's trying to use the words that he's learned in each lesson. Who do you think is going to pick up Japanese the fastest and who will actually remember it when the class is finished? You or Jay? By removing my hearing aid, I forced my brain to use the cochlear implant. I didn't give it a choice. I did one hour of active rehab every night. I listened and I read along to audiobooks for 30 minutes every day and I did 30 minutes of various apps and other programs. For the other 15 hours a day, I listened to music, I talked to people, I went for walks outside to hear other sounds, I went to restaurants, I watched TV, I went to the movies. Now, if I had only done that one hour of rehab and then put my hearing aid back in, it'd be like taking that class without doing any homework or using the skills that I was learning. If you've been doing rehab every day for an hour, for two months and put your hearing aid back on for the rest of the time, consider that you put in 60 hours. At that rate, you have about another year to go before you understand without reading lips, assuming you keep practicing diligently for that year. Now, maybe you've had your cochlear implant for years and you think it's too late for you. It's not. I was activated about the same time as a friend of mine. It had been over five years and she refused to take her hearing aid out. For five years, she insisted her hearing aid ear was better. 
her audiologist finally gave her a challenge. She was asked to keep her hearing aid off for 30 days. She did it, and she has heard things in that 30 days that she hasn't heard in five years. When she finished the challenge, she kept going because she could see how beneficial it had been for her. So let's take a look at my hearing journal again. Now notice that the first couple of weeks, the new sounds were mostly environmental sounds. It was after that that I began noticing certain instances where I wasn't reading lips. Now I can't promise you that you're not gonna need to read lips if you go for a month or two without reading, um, using your hearing aid. There are other factors that play a role in how fast we get to that point. Some of it, again, has to do with age, how long you had good hearing before you began losing your hearing, how, um, how long your auditory nerve was stimulated, how much sound you listen to during the day versus sitting in a quiet room. But I will promise you that in the majority of cases, you will be much better off than you are now. Will it be awkward? Yes. Will you be frustrated? Yes. Are you gonna wanna give up? Yes. But will it be worth it in the long run? Yes. So quit making excuses and just do it. I challenge you. So I hope this, this presentation has given you a good idea of what to expect in the early stages of getting a cochlear implant, as well as giving you some ideas of what you can do to get the best out of it. So I'd now like to answer any questions that you have for me. So please go to the question box and ask your questions. All right, Julie, it looks like we have one question so far. Um, so please feel free, like Julie said, to go to the bottom of your screens to either the chat or the uh, Q&A button and uh, add in any questions you may have. Um, so far, we have somebody wondering um, what types of cochlear implant accessories are available to help out in noisy situations? Okay, they have um, a lot of different types of microphones. They have one that's a, um, it's a, a Roger system. It's a round device that looks like a little disc and there are different uh, speakers, there are different microphones on it. So you can actually put it down on the table. And if you wanna hear someone that's speaking over there, you can press that microphone and it's going to amplify the sound coming from that direction. Um, I have a TV selector, I, I think it's called TV select. And it automatically does Bluetooth with, I have advanced bionics processors and it automatically does Bluetooth so that the TV goes directly to my ears. Um, so there are those types of uh, different microphones. You can have people clip on a microphone so that the sound goes directly to the cochlear implant. So it's like wearing headphones, the sound goes directly to your ears. So those are, are just some of the um, optional accessories that you can get that can help you in noisy situations. All right, looks like we have another one. Um, let's see. What factors, Julie, someone wants to know, what factors would you consider before deciding on what company to uh, go through for a cochlear implant? Um, this one, you, you, that's a tough one. So you wanna do your research on all the different companies find out how they're different, how they're, you know, the same. Um, for me, I went by who had the best technology. It was technology was really important to me. I didn't want to be left behind. Um, you know, in 20 years, I didn't want somebody to still be using the same technology. So that was the, the number one factor that, that made my decision for me. All right, so our next question um, from someone who's scheduled for another implant, um, would it still be a good idea to take off the hearing aid for a month um, if they are getting a, let's see, if they're getting a cochlear, ear, a cochlear implant um, at 21 years old? Yeah, so you, you should discuss it with your audiologist, but 
I have found that, um, okay, so you're saying the other ear implant is two and a half years old. So is that what I'm reading here? Oh, here. excuse me. Yes, I did misread that. The other implant is two and a half years old. Um, would it be a good idea to take off the hearing aid for a month? Yes. So if you're, if you're, if I'm understanding you correctly, um, you're saying that you've had your implant for two and a half years and you wear a hearing aid in your other ear. If you're doing great with your cochlear implant and you're understanding where you want to be, then no. If you are still feeling like your hearing aid is overpowering your cochlear implant and you don't feel like you're doing as well as you think that you should be, then yeah, take it out for at least part of the day. And that's gonna force the brain to use the cochlear implant. And it's, it's not too late after two and a half years, you can still do that. All right, and our next question is, um, is the cochlear implant procedure covered by Medicare? Medicare typically covers one ear um, and then you have to wait a period of time before it will cover a second ear if, if it does at all. But yes, um, Medicare does cover implants. It, it depends on your policy, what your deductions are and things, but yes, it does. All right, and we have a question coming in from a different area here. Um, somebody wanted to know if they could swim with a cochlear implant or if there are ways that, um, or accessories that um, the cochlear implant companies make that enable uh, folks to swim. Okay, I have advanced bionics, so I can only speak to what they have. They have a Neptune processor, which is, is completely waterproof. And then they have uh, another thing that's a, it's a water, um, it's a battery that's made for the water. So for me, I have this, this is what my, my implant looks like. So, this piece right here is the battery, and this piece is the actual processor itself. This is a microphone. Um, so this piece right here gets connected to a waterproof battery, and then I would wear it to, uh, like on my, um, on my bathing suit strap, you could wear it on an armband or a lanyard and things like that, and that is waterproof. So yes, you can there are um, accessories that you can use to go into the water. All right. I can see Kenneth's question. Yes, go okay. ahead and okay. so feel he that says, one. Um, Okay, so he says, can you list in general terms what issues, challenges, adverse effects um, that the recipient will need to overcome in six month increments over the first two years post implant? I really hate to answer these kinds of questions because it's different for every single person. Again, it depends on what your circumstances were before you became implanted. It depends on how much rehab you're willing to do. It depends on um, how often you wear your, your implant, your processor without anything in the other ear. So it's different for every person. The challenges, um, again, are the, the wonky voices that you're gonna hear in the beginning. They sound really bad, <laughs> um, but it doesn't last long. And again, even, even in the very beginning, my brother and I heard such strange strange voices and we're like this is actually so good that even if that's all we ever heard again for the rest of our lives we would still do it so you're going to hear really strange things in the beginning um and that's that's pretty much it's it can be frustrating because the sounds are kind of are, are a little different than than what you're used to and it takes a little while for them to become normal so that's the biggest challenge in the beginning um, as far as for the first two years, again, once you become where you can um, hear speech clearly and once, you know, the volume is good and the voices start sounding more normal, then there's, there's things like um, noisy restaurants and those types of things that can be difficult. 
but some things are going to be better off for you. I'm actually going to the Long Beach Grand Prix on Friday, and I've heard that it's really, really noisy there. And I have a feeling I'm going to do quite well because my processors automatically make the sound quieter. So there's some, some things you're actually going to be able to do better than a lot of other people. So, All right, um, Julie, and our next question, um, can you tell what direction the sounds are coming from? Okay, so if you have one processor, it's a lot harder to do that. You can't tell what this, where the sounds are coming from. I'm bilateral, I have two, and being bilateral, I can tell. Our next question, how does music sound to you now? Music is awesome. Music is, is really great. Um, I used to be, before I got my implants, I couldn't tell what song was playing. Um, I had a really difficult time understanding anything. Now I can make out lyrics to songs. Um, with my processors, I can stream music directly to my processors and the program is, um, is made for music. So it's optimized for music. So the instruments sound fantastic. The vocals sound really good. I can understand the lyrics. I had no idea that normal hearing people could actually understand the lyrics that well. So it's it's really good. I can understand the difference in the voices. Um, you know, it, it's it's really fantastic. All right, and looks like our last question here. Um, does a cochlear implant ever not work at all? Yes, that's a possibility. Um, I believe that they test that out in surgery. When you're in surgery, they actually test to see if it's working or not um, when they're in surgery and they're able to make some adjustments there. Uh, it's rare, but it can happen. I remember asking Dr. Shohat that same question before I was um, had surgery, and he said that, you know, I said, what do you do if it doesn't work? He said, we go in and we do it again. So um, that's my assumption that if it doesn't work, they may be able to go in and, and redo the surgery if they have to. Um, but it is, it is pretty rare. All right. And we have one more that came in, um, says, uh, if you have one good ear, um, that is not the best or not too good, uh, is it also possible to use a cochlear implant in that case? Okay, so um, in order to get a cochlear implant, you have to have a severe to profound hearing loss. So if you qualify for an implant, it's likely going to be much better than what you're listening to now. Um, sometimes if you qualify in both ears, then you have a choice of which ear to do first. Some people say that it's best to use your good ear, um, that that will give you your your best chance of success. So it, that's something that you can talk to your surgeon about and, and you know try to figure out which way to do it. But in most cases, if you qualify for a cochlear implant, you're definitely gonna be better off than you were before, by far. All right, that seems like all the questions we have. That's all we have for you today, folks. We are so thankful. First of all, to you, Julie, for spending the time with us today and to those of you who joined us. If you'd like to listen again or share with someone you know, keep an eye on your email inbox. We will be sending out a recording of today's presentation with Julie, including the question and answer session in the next few days. We look forward to connecting with you again during our next webinar, which will take place in October. And um, if that's all you have, Julie, we will see everyone soon. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.